Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the role of technology, bringing us together or driving us apart. Or, having spoken to the panelists before this session, how technology can bring the generations together. To explore this topic, I'm Trevor Lanwarn, an ILC trustee, and I have great pleasure in uh, chairing this session, which is of absolute great interest to me personally. We have three panelists. I shall introduce each just before they uh, have a five minute talk each. And then we go through questions as you, our audience submit. And I do encourage you please to submit questions. Let's get started. Our first speaker to set the scene is the Global Vice Chair of Industry at EY. He oversees 60,000 industry specialists and is responsible for ensuring EY is at the forefront of industry, industry disruption and convergence, it, convergence issues. So for a very interesting start, please welcome Sean Crawford. Hi, thanks Trevor. Uh, great to be speaking to you all. Um, yeah, so where I'm gonna come from, um, EY uh, every year does some research on end consumer behavior, and particularly around this point around different generations and how they adapt to technolog technolog technological change. Now, um, what is really interesting is we ran some research, and this is the first slide coming up here now, uh, which was um, run in September this year, which was in the UK, which was after the first lockdown. And, and if you have a look at this, what you can see is some quite incredible changes here. Prior, prior years, where those red and yellow columns are at the end, which is the over 55s and the over 65s, they were going down a sliding scale lower and lower and lower. What we found is that the vast majority of uh, the people over 55 are tending to use technology far more than they ever did in the past. And if you look like 36% of all respondents have tried video calling for the first time, but the adoption of online shopping has been highest amongst those over 65. And as you can see, using, uh, using household bills, paying household bills online, uh, managing the public services of, online too, all those things have been real generation shifts where these people have realized the pandemic has been a crisis and they, when they previously have not adopted, they have adopted technology. If you can just move to the next slide. So what we're seeing here is use of exist, usage of existing services during COVID-19. So if you look again here, you're seeing 45% of all households have used the internet more often for browsing and 41% have made more group video calls since the crisis began. Now we look at the over 65s, they're still reliant on fixed line telephony. But look at the fixed number of fixed, the increase in fixed line phone calls that have taken place as a result, uh, through the pandemic. And one in five of this group used their line lines more than ever before than, than the, the prior to the national lockdown. So quite an interesting mix there and quite really interesting to see how the older population have really to, adapted to technology. Please go to the third slide, my last slide I'm gonna show. What we see here is that digital, digital anxieties during COVID-19. And again, this is quite an important point. The concerns around data privacy and security are, are, are pronounced among all households, especially when people are getting cold calls from different parts of the world, challenging them about their cards, their payments, et cetera. And respondents over 55 have really been over-indexing this area. And if you look at this rise here, that those concerned about phishing emails those who are consumers are more cautious than usual about disclosing personal financial information, 48% of over 65s. Households that are concerned as to what personal information or data is captured, uh, over 65 is 55%. And last year, the previous year, they weren't really interested in this because they weren't really using technology. But now suddenly this becomes important uh, and they're really very concerned. And 5G has become, in the, has become in, in very popular now as people talk about whether which, which uh, services are going to be used, which are not going to be used, privacy data problems, over 65s, particularly wary about them and wanting to make that point about service providers and the government in the area. So I think it's really, really interesting when you talk about how the bringing the generations together, Trevor, So in the situation here, what we're seeing is that the older population are going to have suddenly become a lot more accustomed and want to leverage in technologies that have been existing before when they never touched. So I think I'd pass over to you, Trevor, back to, back to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you ever so much, Sean. I just find that absolutely fascinating, the massive change that's taken place and how it has done a levelling up rather than a levelling down or a further divergence. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, next, we have the Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Caribou, the leading educational family entertainment platform 
uh, for kids to have a virtual play date with family and friends. I'm going to be fascinated by this. So to learn more, we are delighted to hear from Max Tuckman from Miami. Over to you, Max. Hi guys, I'm so honored to be here um, because our product uh, is Caribou, as you can see behind me. Um, and we bring families together through virtual play dates. So we allow grandparents to read, draw, and play games in a video call with their grandkids, no matter how far apart they are. We have thousands of books and coloring sheets and recipes and games and origami and activities that you can do uh, together uh, in our library. So it's an in-app library and that's the biggest difference. Some people might think like, well, I have FaceTime, I have Portal. What's the difference between what you do? We have our in-app library that allows grandparents to have conversation starters, right? We found um, that grandparents are, are, you know, having the most difficulty with the pandemic, not being able to see their grandkids and not being able to recreate those magical moments in real life and in person that they used to have. But you go into Caribou, you make that Caribou call, and all of a sudden you can read Thomas and Friends and you can color a uh, coloring sheet together. You can make a pumpkin cookie recipe, um, do all of the things that you used to do uh, in person, but because of the pandemic now have to do it virtually. So as you can imagine, um, we've always had a use case because grandparents uh, have been far away from their grandkids at some point uh, you know, before 2020. And then I think obviously with uh, the pandemic as it you know, raged on, at least here in the US, um, in March, we had almost a billion children out of school across the globe uh, and Caribou 10 x overnight. Um, because, uh, and I think Sean just showed this, right? I mean, grandparents were much more willing to adopt technology, um, download an app on their phone. Uh, we're on Android, mobile, and web. We actually added the web this summer because we had so many, we call them glamas, glamorous grandmas. That's our core customer. Um, and uh, in Spanish, it's fabuelas, abuelas fabulosas, because we're in Miami. So of course we have a Spanish name for them as well. And um, you know, for, for these glamas, for grandparents in general across the globe, and we have customers in over 200 countries and territories, and again, books in 10 different languages. Um, you know, when the pandemic, uh, when people I think realized that they, they were not gonna see their grandkids for the next 12 to 18 months, Caribou became a lifesaver. And we've heard so much uh, feedback from grandparents who, we had a grandmother in Canada whose grandkids are in the US and she was starting to get depressed because of the social isolation, right? Social isolation is a very big problem um, uh, outside of the pandemic. And uh, she said that Caribou lit up her world um, and that it was a game changer for her and her family because she was actually, and, and she talks about, um, you know, kind of back to our topic, she says, you know, technology not only enables connections, but because of things like Caribou and the technology that's available today, you can actually enrich relationships. Um, and we had a, a father actually on Twitter recently in India who said that his parents haven't met his nine month old son because of the pandemic. But again, technology really plays a role um, in connecting people so that they can still engage him in play and read books to him that are high contrast for babies in our zero to three category. So um, you know, I think for families right now, the number one priority is to stay safe, but the number two priority is to stay sane. And we're very grateful that Caribou exists and can help families stay sane. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, I love the idea of glamours. Um, I shall remember that one. Uh, <laughs> just uh, if you can just tell us what you were saying before we started about Apple, um, just to give some context, uh, if you're able to say that. I that can, I can. We can announce it. So uh, yesterday, uh, Caribou was named one of the top 15 apps. Literally, there were only 15 apps uh, Kind of awarded yesterday by Apple, but we're one of we're one of them, um, one of the five in the helpfulness category, um, and we were awarded that yesterday because of the work that we did in 2020 to connect families to make sure that people again had a, a better engaging relationship building type video call uh, across the globe with the multi generations. Right, we serve five year olds to you know 75 year olds and everyone in between. Um, so yeah, we're 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 pretty excited about this. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Max. That's wonderful. Uh, before I just move on, I'm just checking, but I don't think any questions have come, come through yet. So please uh, do submit questions. Um, 
Now, um, finally, please welcome uh, Gisela uh, Dolan. She is the Chief Global Advocacy Officer uh, at Home Instead Senior Care. Home Instead are the world's leading provider of at-home care services. They are in 1,200 locations around the world, with many in the UK and the USA. So from absolutely key sector for this discussion, and based in Omaha, Nebraska, over to you, Gisela. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. And congratulations, Max. It's wonderful. A testament to the work you do. And we see that play out every day at home instead because we do serve our older populations and we know the importance of connecting with their families, their um, children and their grandchildren and the ability of our home care services and technology working together, that marriage, that magic to help us provide more care. I also love what you said, Max, about enriching relationships. At home instead, we our motto is relationship before task. We definitely support families around the globe with the tasks of aging, um, keeping people safe and secure and aging in place with dignity and respect. But so much of what we do is honoring people toward the end of their life and helping them feel um, that they're having that worthwhile life experience and that they're connecting in meaningful ways with the people and things they care the most about. So we've been providing care in the home for 26 years kind of before the internet and all the things, the apps and all the wonderful technology we see today. And we see the value again of, of focused on relationship and connecting generations through our services. And it's been very manual, but over time, like everything in the world, we're seeing the digitalization of our industry. And we see technology bridging generations and providing value in a couple of different ways. One way is sort of on the back end, the infrastructure work that we do. So in terms of connecting our professional caregivers who go out into the home with our local offices everywhere, we employ all generations. We have caregivers in their 20s all the way up to caregivers in their 80s. So we have a very multi-generational workforce everywhere. And we're embedding more technology um, and integrating more tech offerings to and support and empower that work experience. So we see a bridge there just in the way we can provide a better work experience and connection point. We also see technology as a way to connect the family members who are typically the ones obtaining the care. So Max, uh, I love the glamas. I agree with you, Trevor. That's a wonderful term. I'll have to share that with my mom. She'll love that um, with my, my daughter. But uh, we have a term we've named our main consumer, Kathy. She's in her 40s to 60s. She's caring for her parents typically or a partner and needing care. And Kathy wants to know that her loved one is safe and secure and that peace of mind and respite. And so technology helps with that communication. So there are tools, um, portals and uh, uh, different um, apps and things that we're exploring with ways to provide more of that information to the family. So they really feel connected to the care experience. So again, bridging generations, because that tends to be more of our um, Gen X and boomers, although we're seeing many more millennial caregivers, um, younger people caring for their grandparents, their grandmas, for example. Um, so on both sides, helping each other. But lastly, we're seeing the value of technology, and I think we've all talked about it today, um, in addressing social isolation and impacting connection, advancing connection with our older populations. And we know there's different levels of uptake in technology with our older populations. And we've been focusing on integrating um, consumer facing technology that's built for our older populations so that they're able to connect and access information and people that they want to connect with. And so we've invested in an organization called GrandPad here in the US and then through our other locations throughout the globe, we're testing other models of delivering tablet based care in the home. So it's ways for people to um, do video chats, virtual chats, listen to music, radio, read about the news. Um, but it's also a way for, again, the other generations to connect because there's this um, concept of circle of trust within the grand pad where the um, family can determine who has access to that engagement and connection with that older adult. So it's a safe, secure environment um, and that bridges many generations. We see three and four generations connecting that way. 
So we definitely think coming from a very high touch industry that's been very manually provided in terms of how we deliver care over the years, we're evolving how we deliver care through technology and using technology to help us better scale our services and create even more meaningful connections. And that has been highlighted and accelerated like everything by the global pandemic this year. Thank you so much, Gisela. Thank you. Uh, not only have we got Glamour's Resort, we've also got Kathy to talk yeah. about. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Which is great. Uh, and I think it's just so important, uh, the uh, areas that you and your company are in and the enormous potential there to develop it much, much further. Uh, when I looked a second ago, there were still no questions mm. coming through. So um, whilst we're waiting for questions, um, I think what I want to do is to ask a general question of each of you uh, and let's see if you come up, let's hope that there's some difference of opinion between you, let's say. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, my question is this, what have each of you learned about technology bringing the generations together and what do you see as the barriers? So who wants to go first on that? Uh, let's ask Sean because he's been longest without saying anything. Then, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, no, and, and I think look what, you, what you've seen from my, my my graphs there is that the crisis has been a, has been a, a massive catalyst for change. Yeah, um, is is basically people uh, in lockdown wanted to talk to their families, and that's what they've done. They've embraced technology. What this has proven is that when technology has been something that people don't want to look at, that iPad, that's too, ooh, it's too complicated for me. I don't want to go near that. Suddenly realize when I do look at it and I can get into it, and my, usually my family have helped me use it, and, and they're the trainers and develop uh, trainers for to getting access to it. Suddenly they suddenly go, oh, I never knew I had this. This is amazing. I can stream this television. I can talk to my grandchild in Miami, maybe, yeah? and, and all those sort of things. So suddenly I think that has been uh, an enormous catalyst. I think the challenge we've got is that but there are issues, there are clear issues about getting technology to, to the older people by getting broadband access. I mean, this is going to be a significant point, especially for those in more rural areas. So I think, I mean, the governments and so on do need to look at that and supporting that. And we've also found in the early days of the pandemic that in care homes, they didn't get access to the internet in many cases. Uh, and this was a big problem. They couldn't, they couldn't see their families, but they couldn't actually talk to their families, communicate with families, apart from the traditional phone. So that has changed. I know that many care homes have started investing in that area, but that is something I think is pretty critical, um, Trevor, that we need to learn from what were those barriers. And tell me they were, they were mindset and they were actually some, some point of it was, it was connectivity. Yeah. So uh, absolutely, because uh, I've, I've got personal experience of uh, that uh, with my mother who was in a care home and she just we just couldn't connect with her uh, with her over Wi-Fi. Um, uh, who was going to go next, Gisela? <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, Sean. As we look at technology, and, and one of the things we've we've appreciated about our grandpad is it's both um, Wi-Fi as well as um, um, able to be accessed through cellular services. So that provides an expanded accessibility, which we think is so important, especially, you know, we're, we're global. So we look at developing countries and how we can bring more technology to our developing countries. So access um, is just critical. So agree with that. I think what we've seen in terms of technology is there's so much technology out there that's remarkable. I listen to what Max, what your, your organization is, well, it's beautiful. And what we're seeing in the development of apps and um, the wearables and the drones and all the things, um, they're, they're fantastic. Where, where we're at with our local footprint, we're with more than 100,000 people every day. Um, the challenge has been just the uptake of the technology in the, in the right manner. Um, I think like anything in life, I think we all use our, you know, our cell phones and, and our cars. And when we have updates in the technology with the software, it's like, darn it, now what are, where do I find this app? You know, we all, it's change management. So much of this is about um, accelerating change management, change in behavior, so that we're able to integrate these tools and resources that are so valuable, these innovations that are so valuable in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and it takes often to, to, I think it was Trevor Sean's point, a crisis, a, an urgency for us to lean into that, which is why I think we've seen this expanded uptake and very accelerated experience that Max and others are having um, in technology because of, of that urgency that, that forces that change. But where we sit with our local footprint and being in homes, we find 
we can be the ones to bring the technology in with the family or with our professional caregivers and engage our older population so they understand the value. They see why this is meaningful to them. Mm. Um, when you listen to what Max is talking about, we see the value. They connect with the people they love the most. If we can share that value proposition, if we can explain that why about all these different wonderful innovations and technologies in a way that all generations can see that value. And then we have organizations like ours that are there that can help people lean into that and use the tools in the ways that are going to help them achieve that value. I think we'll have success. So as we look at technology, it's not so much that there's maybe lack of innovation. There's a wonderful amount of innovation. It's maybe we've had lack of a proper engagement. I also think about how technology can help us bridge just our care services and healthcare. There's so much power in that, but we need the data to be accurate. We need the data to be meaningful and shared in a way that all of the different stakeholders can consume it and make decisions to empower that aging experience at home and connect other generations to that aging um, plan and experience for their loved one. And so again, using services like ours and others to empower people to use technology to gather that data in a way that's meaningful for everyone, we think that's the future and, and where we need to go. And again, I think this, this pandemic has been a catalyst for that, as Sean said earlier, getting us to think about the value and the beauty of technology and accelerating that um, engagement that's so important. Uh, thanks very much, Shizela. And if, if Max, do you have any thing to add. I should say that um, I've now got some questions come through, oh. so we are not going to be without discussion. <laughs> Max, over to you. Yeah, um, Gisela, you, you, you nailed it. Um, and I think the thing that we found um, is exactly right. It, so we're, you know, we're a cool, hip, tech savvy app, but if we're supporting glamas, we have to meet them where they are. And, and I think that's a big lesson this year was you meet your users where they are, you make the experience easier for them. Um, and so that's why we built the web version of Caribou. So we're on phone, tablet and web, iOS and Android, because you know, that, uh, that, that's how we get so global. But the web, uh, like that, we had to meet grandparents where they were. They were on web, right? They were searching on Bing. So we were like, okay, we've, we've got to meet them there. Um, <laughs> And they want to they want to see things bigger, right? They want to have that full experience with their grandchild. The grandchild's running around with a phone, uh, but they want it on the web. And then the second thing that we also again, and Sean showed this in his slides, we had to install a phone number because again, we yeah. we couldn't rely on the FAQ, right? Like you know, our our engineers on our team were like, well, we answered that in the FAQ, and I'm like, no grandparent <laughs> is going to the FAQ. <laughs> They don't even know. And, and that what we did was a lot of customer interviews and we realized a lot of our grandparents, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a technology divide. They just didn't even know the question to ask. They were having an issue and they didn't know like, is it my router? Is it my Wi-Fi? Is it my, is it my device? Is it my operating system? They just didn't even know that those words existed. And so we set up a customer support team specifically for grandmas um, and grandparents because we recognize that they just want to call. They just want to say, am I doing this right? Um, can you help me update my, my OS? And then if we can get them to that place where their you know, caribou experience can be magical, then, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, that's it. So, um, yeah, those were two big lessons we learned this year. Great. If I could, uh, and th thanks for that. I, I, I yep. do want to just come in with one of the points made on the questions, um, because it's so relevant to what you've just been saying. Um, so from Alison uh, Ben Zimra, we found our residents are hesitant to use Zoom, but very comfortable with WhatsApp and FaceTime videos. Gisela, mm -hmm. you talked about grandpad. Yes. Is, is this specifically for care homes? Um, I, I, or, you know, trying to think about the best solutions for virtual communications sure. that resonates. Any comments or observations? Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to build to you on what Max had said earlier. Uh, yes. So the GrandPad is more of a virtual call that feels more like a FaceTime experience. Um, what we found is iPhones are amazing. I love my iPhone. We love our Androids. But they were not made for um, seniors physically and their changes as we age our skin on our finger changes so we actually struggle on an iphone my stepfather um, is in his late 70s and has dementia we've tried to have him use different tablets and he's like they don't work and we think it's because of his dementia it's actually his hands 
don't move the things like we do, like our hands do. Um, and hearing things and seeing things, you know, wanting things to be larger and all of those things as we age, that aging journey, those are, that's, I love what you said, Max, meeting people where they're at. So actually GrandPad, um, they, part of the, what we love about that organization um, and why we're working with them is they've got a set of super seniors that are on their board and their 80s and 90s that inform them and pilot and test the GrandPad and give feedback. Sure. And that's how they discovered the things about the fingertips and the site. Um, they discovered that if um, the charging, plugging of a, a plugging of the grand pad into the, the wall for charging, which seems intuitive to many of us, was difficult for some of the seniors. They actually had a woman who got a, a very long charging cable, feet and feet and feet and feet, and duct taped it to her grand pad because she didn't couldn't remember how to plug it in and she didn't want to lose a charge. And they're like, <laughs> be an easy dock. So they created a dock. Max. Set it in. Yeah. So exactly what Max is saying, like those things. So Max, we have a phone number on the grad pa grand pad where people can push a button and call a number. And we have a response team both here at Home Instead and with the grand, grand pad team that answers those kinds of questions, because that's exactly what, what um, people want is that, that connection and knowing um, how to, uh, how to use the thing. But we're trying to create that um, uh, elegant, simple solution, because I do think like Apple products have that for many of us, but maybe not for older populations as much. They're evolving. And so uh, can, can I can I just come in? Because I do want to bring Max in to uh, just comment, <laughs> because I do hope when they show the recording of uh, this session, uh, they pick up on the uh, absolute uh, shock and awe faces you were pulling then, Max, <laughs> some of the points. So did you want yeah. to, to, to raise anything on what Gisela has just been saying? Yeah, I mean, she's she's saying exactly what's happening, and it's um it's so. I mean, even the iPhone when it was built, I remember as a woman, I was like, this was not built for me, right? Like, I was like, I have long nails, like, why can't I tap with my right? Like, there's just, <laughs> and I I love that Grandpa has that super senior board, and that's actually something we're building this year is making sure that we're building an advisory board with um with our seniors, and and that's why we have the and we love the phone calls, we love when seniors call in because we learn so much. Um, yes. We learn, oh, this didn't make sense to me or this wasn't written in a way that I understood. It's that UI and UX that you know, we as app builders are always kind of focused on um, because we have to say so much with images and we have such limited space uh, and we're, we're telling a story and, and we're actually pretty proud of the fact, and again, we're so excited about this award because we have to tell that story in images for a five-year-old to understand and a you know, 65 year old to understand. Sure. And I think, um, again, that ability to to jump on a phone call with someone who's, you know, not frustrated, because that's, that's actually what we also found is parents ended up being the geek squad, mm -hmm. right? Um, or the Apple genius support during the pandemic, yes. because <laughs> you couldn't go in to the store anymore, right? And you couldn't. Um, so it was it was us, it was our millennial generation. And our millennial generation was like, we're already stressed with so many yeah, other things. I don't need like, yeah. <laughs> right? so, so, so just, just yeah. I, I want one of those grandpads. I, I think that <laughs> yes. is brilliant. And what, um, I've learned, yeah. what I've learned from this call today, one thing I'll take away is the skin change for the older people. I hadn't realized my 89 year old father has not got dementia, but he struggles like hell with his little yes. telephone, uh, television control. And you're right about the charging. I think that is brilliant. This is something yes. we do need to push very hard. <laughs> We need to be thinking about for sure. Trevor, uh, and, uh, can I can I bring in another question? Can I bring in another Trevor? question? Because can I, I just real quick? I want to make sure yeah. we answered Allison's yeah. question. She was asking the grand pad and other tablets. What we're seeing in home care and with um, long term care facilities is it can be B 2 B business to business or business to consumer. Grand pad works with consumer cellular and others and sells those directly through Best Buy, Target, and others. So families can directly access those. But what we're finding is more technology partners are coming to the table to work with people that you know access. I mean, I think about us, Max, like maybe we connect, right? Because we're in the homes with seniors. We have the footprint. We bring the technology in through our agencies. So to answer Allison's question, yeah, we're seeing grand pads and other technologies be connected directly to facilities and home care agencies like ours, where we're the ones then distributing to our populations. And because of the Wi-Fi and cellular access in a facility, we don't have to worry about plugging into the Wi-Fi. They can use the cellular tower and, and coverage that exists within that, that long-term care home. Thank you, Trevor. My pleasure. It's great to hear from you. Uh, uh, we've got a question from Diane Kenwood, which is very relevant because she's been asking, uh, 
what is it that you can do to make sure that the elderly generation can keep in touch with further developments as they go on from time to time? And I've been so impressed at the way you're all coming up with solutions, and I just love that. Are there any solutions for this issue about how to um, keep them up to speed on what's going on? Hands up if you want to answer it. Happy sure. to go. Yeah, so look, I think what we talked about, what we've learned suddenly is that over the course of the last few months is that people have picked this up because who have they been speaking to? They've been probably speaking to their families. So their families probably are tend to be the people who are going to be able to help them understand the next generation of technology because they're going to get more inquisitive. And I'm certainly seeing, I'm sure if we run the survey again in December after the second lockdown, we'll see even further rises, but more inquisitiveness about, wow, this technology has done this, maybe something else can. And I go back to it, Gisela, if we can get these ground pads or equivalent technologies out there to make it easier for them to use, easier yeah. to charge, then I think we're going to see a, 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 another generational shift. Yeah. Absolutely. I would suggest, um, too, a way to connect is, I think some of that is on us in the home care industry and with long-term care organizations that regularly interact with our older generations, even if we're not tech companies per se, I think it's our job to connect with those resources that make your aging yeah. experience better. And so we really look at our, our services. We do a lot of care coordination. We're connecting families with durable medical equipment. And um, if they are looking at maybe facilities down the road, long-term care homes, we look at those with pharmacists and so forth. We think technology is another institution or, or resource that we are connecting um, those we serve and their families with. So I think there's a real opportunity for technology companies to think about who is most often connecting with um, the, the millennial, Gen X, Gen Z, and then boomer and older generations, and where are their roles in the aging experience? Are they a family member getting care for a parent? Are they the, the person needing care themselves? And, and who are they serving? And then bring those resources forward so that we can then share those out. I think that's one way to get it out there. I also think it's just um, you know, technology, understandably, we go towards younger people, a lot of our products and services, fashion, we think about younger generations, and that's important, we need to do that. But we need to look at who our consumer base is going to be and who's going to be buying services and products into the future. I don't know the numbers across the world, but I know in the US, it's women in their 40s to 70s will manage most of the GDP of America for the next decade. So if you're in business and offering services and products, you should probably be thinking about what might they want. And as they age, they want to have an empowered aging experience. So as we have more tech companies spin up, let's think about how we connect with seniors. And I would suggest, like they do at GrandPad, bring in older people to speak to their peers about technology and it's peer to peer and bring younger generations in to connect with the older generation so they can empower and share as well. I'm going to bring in a question from Sophia Dimitridis to change the subject um, just a little bit. Um, she says, what should be done by way of government support to help bring th things together between the generations? And maybe I can expand on that because ILC is, a, is an organization which has a lot of influence uh, and is very prominent in this area. And so maybe if you could, uh, when addressing that question, also address the question as to what you think ILC could do as part of that uh, to just help. Uh, the generations come together and do this leveling up on technology. Uh, it's a bit of a tricky question, that one is. Um, so I've been speaking a little while to give you time to think. But thinking time is over. Who shall I pick on? <laughs> Max, do you want to have a go? Sure. I think um, I, I used to work in, in the US government, um, and I'm always thinking of what government can do to support uh, communities more. And I come from an education background. And one of the, the most heartbreaking things we've seen over the pandemic is uh, like we've been talking about, not only it, it's a it's a bigger digital divide than than I think every I, we all kind of knew it. And then all of a sudden the pandemic, I think, really showed how big the chasm is. And it's a device digital divide um, on the children and senior side. And it's a, an access um, to, you know, high quality, uh, high internet speeds, um, whether it's broadband or Wi-Fi or 5G or, you know, and it's so interesting, um, the slides talking about how scared people are of 5G. And I think that that's a place where governments can play a bigger role is in information. Um, so explaining, uh, you know, how these, how these technologies are out there and that they are helpful. Um, 
I think setting up like the CDC does, right? Setting up informational uh, documents that help people understand how to connect to family, you know, what is available, what free resources are, um, except, you know, what government programs exist. Uh, for seniors who are on a fixed income and cannot afford or do not live in a in a in a place where that Wi-Fi or that cellular is provided, um, so I think governments have a, an information responsibility, but then also um, an, a, an equity uh, responsibility to make sure that um, you know people again have access to devices because. The, the thing is, I, I, I see internet and and you know mobile devices almost as as uh, it's it's becoming as important as shelter, right? I mean, for all of the the things that have happened during the pandemic, we learned we have to get information to people quickly, yeah. and and we have to make sure that everyone um, has access to those right those devices and and that um, and that internet. Um, so I, I do think the government is is going to start having to be more responsible about making sure that that access is equitable. I would, I would echo that, Max. I think that's beautifully said. Um, I think another opportunity, it's something Home Instead's pursuing is um, service years, ways for government um, and private institutions to fund internships where we bring younger generations in to learn about the aging experience. Um, so we actually launched a program uh, in the States and we're taking it globally last year called Champions of Aging. We partnered with an organization in the States called Service Year Alliance. They were helping the catalyst with a uh, uh, Teach for America, Peace Corps, and AmeriCorps. And so they're very passionate about how do we bring service year opportunities to young people to learn about different um, industries. And we saw there was a gap. There's nothing really about aging. And it, we all age. It's universal. And why don't we connect our ge younger generations more to the issues of aging so they can have a wonderful aging life course and journey that they plan for, as well as help them solve these issues that we're all facing. And so we've launched a program where we have a service year where we pay for a year of of students to get education around all aspects of aging. And then they go out into community and serve on um, whether it's area agencies on aging in the US or other um, um, organizations that are supporting outreach to seniors in need and community. And we wanna take that program and expand it. We wanna work with uh, private sponsors like Walmart years ago sponsored Teach for America. We want more and more private industry to support this because bringing those champions, those aging advocates into whatever industry they pursue, whether it's medicine, tech, the law, financial, what have you, they will bring that knowledge of aging to that entire organization and empower that organization to think more about how we support um, all of as we age. And we'd love to see government fund that as well as we've seen these service years expand throughout. And we think it could be a global effort to really bridge our, our young and, and our older populations and technology is a big component of that. Yeah, when I worked at Mayor Bloomberg's office uh, when I was in New York City, we had a program called ReServe and it was internships for seniors um, to come back into the workforce and provide, yeah. uh, you know, kind of that, that, that in, intuition and, and, and say, Hey, you know what, that's a great government service, but this is why seniors won't be able to access it. Or this is why yeah. it won't make sense for seniors. Um, and it was those, I think it was a year long internship where, you know, people would come in and, and provide that kind of perspective. So I, th I think that's, that's great. And I, uh, ILC itself is always very keen on, uh, people as they get older continuing to uh, re-engage to retrain uh, you name it I was I was just thinking um, from what you were saying about it's vital to provide information uh, and that if fundamentally the elderly can't understand an FAQ then they're not going to be able to pick up on information so this group of the 42 uh, the 30 to 60 year olds uh, acting as intermediaries, as uh, I think uh, you were saying, Chisler, is absolutely critical on that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring Sean in um, uh, as a fellow ILC trustee to see if he's got any reflections on yeah. the sorts of things yeah. that have been mentioned. Over to you, Sean. Yeah, so I think all those points were spot on. I think, look, I'm not going to repeat exactly what, uh, exactly what Max Chisler said. I think spot on. What I would say, though, from an influencing and lobbying point of view from, from the ILC UK perspective, Trevor, where we are, and obviously Diane's on the call too, is that I think we, we've got an ability through the links we've got, especially with Baroness Sally Greengrass, our chief, our chief executive, who pulls together lobby groups all the time, across party lobby groups. So we can talk about how can we influence more connectivity, more connectivity into care homes. Maybe there's something we can be doing talking about carers themselves. How do we educate carers more in technology? How can we provide more technology support so they can connect better with, with their 
when they're caring, the normal caring responsibilities, maybe technology caring becomes part of the cu curriculum, <laughs> the daily curriculum. It's those sort of things that we, I think, can can help. And I think, so your last point there about the pub, uh, bringing the private sector, I think the cross-public private sector point is important. The private sector are keen to, to play a part. And I think the public, again, from a government point of view, we should be lobbying to make sure we get these cross-party groups and get private sector people involved. That's what we do at the ILC. We bring companies together for helping in the lobbying and sponsoring, we bring them into these conversations. So I think there's some really good food for thought there and some opportunities, um, Trevor, that we, we could be picking up. There from, is, uh, from absolutely. Well, one of the, uh, a couple of questions have come through um, about differences between the United States and the UK. Uh, let me just see if I can read one of them. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry about this, Max. Um, I was keen to introduce, this is from Judith, I was keen to introduce Caribou, um, but I was finding the dialogue was very American English. Are you going to do anything? Um, and um, let me just find another one. Um, is anyone aware of organizations' efforts to support older adults with access to technology devices in the UK, for example? That was from Rosaria. Um, any sort of thoughts on uh, being divided by a common language or whatever the phrase is. That's actually something um, that we've been, we've tried to be very thoughtful about is recognizing that we serve a lot of different users across the globe and even here in the United States, right? I mean, we serve so many languages uh, in the United States. I mean, we have tons of books in Spanish um, on Caribou and even Haitian Creole, which is a huge community here in Miami. Um, what we ended up doing, and and I, I love the feedback, we have a ton of us born books and Thomas and Friends. So there's some UK friendly uh, content on Caribou. But as we expanded globally this year, uh, we started building out more of our activities and games because of that fact that we we knew that there were um, regional dialect issues, right? Or even in Spanish, I speak Spanish. Um, and my Cuban Spanish is much is very different from Mexican Spanish, right? There's a lot of different words. So the activities and the games um, being kind of increased this year was was a re in a response to that because it, the publishing world is is very difficult to work with, <laughs> um, and it's slow. Uh, and so we were like, all right, well, we're just going to create our own content and make sure that people have uh, you know activities that they can still do on Caribou, no matter what language or dialect they speak. I. I would add to just we we have a number of locations throughout the UK and the US and and there are differences culturally and language and so forth and we want to honor those and I think the, those questions by Rosario and others is, are really well placed and I think it comes down to how highly personalized our aging journeys are and how highly localized it is and we have these amazing solutions like what Max's company does a caribou that we can transcend across um, boundaries and oceans and communities to connect. So we have these wonderful enterprise level solutions that, that can serve everyone really. Um, and we want to connect those then to that local experience. And that's what we found to be some of the magic in, in what Home Instead does is because we have local leadership and, um, lo and local caregivers in those communities with the language and the cultures and, and the social norms and understanding and connecting, but bringing these more enterprise global solutions um, in the tech space to our, our local users and, and older populations. So I think that again is another bridge as we connect the beauty of the high tech world and the ability to scale and connect a, a, around the world in a moment to that high touch, highly localized beauty of what we're seeing through home care. And bringing those together will, will help us um, continue to have people feel like they're being met and they're the place they're at, as Max said, and in that unique way that we all want as we age. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think one of the benefits of webinars like this event is to try and do those bridgings. I think it's tremendous for assisting in, in that area. Um, now, we've only got a few minutes left. And I've got another question from Diane Kenwood I just want to put to you as, as perhaps your final question and maybe uh, have a minute or so each in, in response, which is everything that we've been talking about so far has been about innovations and how technology can help. Do you see anything from what you've seen about technology driving the generations apart, which is part of the headline for uh, this talk? 
So are you seeing anything or experiencing anything which is causing generations to go apart from technology? And what would your thoughts be on how to resolve that or find solutions to make things better? Um, once again, um, I don't know who to go to first. I'll, uh, I'll pick on Shizilla. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll pick on you. Thank you, Trevor. I'll, I'll try to do the crap. Uh, I, we haven't seen a lot of division in our experience in home care. I know it exists. I would suggest that the best way to continue to use technology to bridge generations is have um, our younger generations help connect our older generations with that technology, whether it's in ways like Max's company does or through our home care where we have younger family caregivers and professional caregivers in, in being empowered with technology and connecting their older loved ones with technology. Um, we think it's a way to, to connect and, and strengthen those relationships. So again, I think it's um, all of us learning from each other and using those tools in the way to, to connect and, and have each person feel like their the relationship is meaningful and that both are being hard and connected in ways that maybe technology, other than if they didn't have technology, they wouldn't be able to, to connect. So um, we haven't seen major hurdles, but I think we just need to be very meaningful and mindful as we move forward with integrating more technology into our lives. Yeah, I would actually echo exactly what you said. And I think back to the, the piece about customer support, I think if there's anything that has, that, that, if there's any place where technology has kind of driven people apart, it's that millennial parent feeling like they have to be the geek squad for the, the you know, grandparent. Um, and, and that has caused a lot of frustration, I think, especially during the pandemic. And because what we also heard from people before the pandemic was, oh yeah, I have to wait for my mom to show up for Thanksgiving. And then I, you know, I'll set up her computer then, or like, I'm going to buy an iPad for, for Hanukkah or Christmas. And so there were a lot more, um, high touch points where that parent could serve as the, the support. Um, and so I, I think knowing that that could cause fissures in families and multi-generational families, I think we as companies and again, as governments need to do more to support um, grandparents and seniors where they are um, so that that burden, there's almost already such a caregiving burden on um, the, you know, that the 25 to, to you know, 50 um, kind of parent group. Uh, I think, I think that's a place where I, I see more problems coming. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's on fire yet, but um, that's a place where I think more organizations, especially like the ILC, could come in and, and support uh, families more. Brilliant. And Sean, any final thoughts? Yeah. So I think if we'd gone back, if we went go back 12 months to December 2019 and we we're sitting here and I showed my slides then, I think you'd probably say there could be some argument to say that we were driving generations apart because there was a lot of people who didn't know what to do. Their mindset wasn't quite there. But that's definitely changed. Uh, but I would say that um, the things to answer Diane's question, so I think the things about getting access to physical tablets that actually people can use for the right skin to, skin mm. uh, um, involvement, really important. Making sure that the connectivity is in place, those things, and they, until we get those places, especially in, in developing markets, which I, I guess you're, you're from a global perspective in Africa, et cetera, it's going to be a real challenge. Yeah, so I, th I imagine that issue is still there to a degree. I don't know what the research shows, but I would say that uh, it's, it, there's been a, obviously been a dramatic change, but I, I would watch out and make sure we get those other points right. I think we can we can change it even further. That those generations come together. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Um, there's been so much wonderful input there from everyone, and lots to think about. Uh, so for you and the audience, I would encourage you to um, you know look through this again and pick up on some of the things that have been said uh, when you get the link as I'm sure you will. I'd just like to finish and conclude by saying an absolute tremendous thank you to all our panelists for being so open and sharing of everything that you're doing. It has been great. And, and with that, I will say goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much. Trevor, thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.